It's up to you, feel free. Um, so my name is Charles Small, and I'm the director of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And today we have uh, a real honor to have uh, Professor Uzi Rabi here. Uzi is going to speak about Iran, Israel, and the Arab world, new discourses in a changing environment. Uzi Rabi uh, is a uh, professor of Middle East Studies, is the director of the Diane Center at Tel Aviv University. He recently published a book called International Intervention in Local Conflicts, Conflict Management, and, the, and Crisis Revolution Since the Cold War. It was published by IP Taurus uh, in 2010. Professor Ravi also published a, an article entitled A Political Culture and Foreign Policy Shaped by Moderate Religious Views, The Case of the Sultan of Oman, which was published and presented at a conference in Oman uh, held at the University of Tübingen in, 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 of Germany. In early September, he spoke at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and at a number of engagements in Argentina on issues of the Palestinian state imminent, uh, sorry, is a Palestinian state imminent, perspectives and possible scenarios. These events were organized by the uh, Tel Aviv University and host universities in South America. Uh, Professor Rabi also participated in international conferences throughout the world and recently uh, gave an important paper on the Middle East between democracy and state, and state failure, question mark. Uh, and the topic was focusing on Yemen as a failed state. Professor Rabi regularly, regularly appears on a number of national and international uh, news outlets. He's a regular consultant for the, for the media. His area of expertise includes modern, the modern history of states and societies in the Persian Gulf, state building in the Middle East in general, oil and politics in the Middle East, and the Iranian Arab, uh, Iranian -Arab or Sunni Shiite relations uh, in the region. He's really one of the foremost uh, experts in the world on these issues, and it's really um, an honor. Anuza came all the way across from Israel to be here this evening. Thank you. Hmm. Well, thanks a lot, Charles, and um, I'm really honored to be here, and it's my pleasure, of course. And uh, uh, what I would like to share with you is some of the thoughts, some of the insights we do have in Tel Aviv University in the center, uh, the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern Studies. So let me just uh, use this presentation. Yeah, oh, so, so let me use this presentation first. say is that, you know, I mean, three years since the uh, outbreak of the, what we call the Arab Spring, there is a tumultuous change in the Middle East. Uh, our basic assumption, or working assumption, is that the, same, the, the change is that dramatic that many of the notions, the insights, the yes. tools... And then the microphone keeps making 
So what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, many of the insights, the tools we used in the 20th century, to a large extent, are not valid anymore. And what we are trying in front of the new circumstances is to create a new set of tools and insights with which to better analyze this region. One of the main things that uh, we have to deal with while dealing with that new Middle East is what we call failed states. You know, dictators were toppled here in Tunisia, in Egypt, Libya, and Yemen. In some cases, the result was kind of a very legitimate political debate, as is the case in Tunisia and Egypt. But in other cases, when the community is comprised of different sects, minorities, religious types, the weakening or the downfall of the dictator created sort of a breakup and the state that was created, uh, uh, let's say, in the aftermath of the First World War by the British or the French, and was from the beginning kind of a mosaic of sects and minorities, is being, being broken up to its components. If we can see the, uh, the nowadays Syria, this is the state that formerly used to be known as Syria. Basically, there is no Syria today anymore. Why? Because uh, Syria is being controlled by different forces. The regime, this is the red stuff. Yellow is the Kurds. Here we have Al-Qaeda activists that came to the fore. Druze and Alawites. Sunnis and Alawites. Just to make a long story short, what we have in Syria is not only a dictator which is struggling against the rebels, so to speak, as was the case in Egypt and Tunisia. Here, straight away after the uh, outbreak of the riots, what we got is uh, many actors, regional actors, picking up each one of them, a client of their own in Syria, and turning Syria into kind of a hub of many orientations. Syria is being broken up to its components or the components that were there before the state was created. So what we are trying to say here is that history comes to the fore. If you would like to do or to know what's going on in Syria, you have to be familiar with the components or the ingredients that were used in order to create Syria in the French mandate 100 years ago. And that uh, is typical or uh, applicable to Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Lebanon. And the rule is quite clear. When a state is being broken up, it is becoming a bunch of power centers. And in a very fantastic way, each component strives back to its what we call pre-state construction. So it's sort of a game with history. And what we have here more often than not is the pre-state identities who come to the fore. Basically, when the West is dealing with the Middle East, more often than not, the United States, Europe, are using what we call the nationalistic scale. Tell me if you are a Syrian, Lebanese, Iraqi. We think that this is not the best definition or tool one should come up with in order to better understand the geopolitical game here. 
In order to be familiar with what's going on, you have to first differentiate between Sunnis and Shiites. Kurds, Druze, Maronites, Alawites. And these are identities that are being gleaned from times immemorial. Nationalistic ideas here were created by the British and the French in the aftermath of the First World War. Relatively speaking, historically speaking, this is a very, very young phenomenon. When we talk about Arabs, Persians, Turks, Sunnis, Shiites, Alawites, etc., we do talk about millennia. And in a very uh, fascinating way, on top of this Arab Spring, internet, Facebook, Twittering, everything is right. But in the back door of this phenomenon, what came to the fore with the breakup of states, all these identities, primordial identities, scientifically put, that are dictating the rhythm nowadays. So what we have, just to sum up this, what I just said till now, failed states. Syria is just a case to the point. You go to Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Libya, the state is being broken up and what counts is the power centers that are in are similar to what we had before the state was where it was created. We don't have time to go and to just uh, delve into that in too many details, but basically this is what we have here. So here again, these are the boundaries of Syria. Here is Iraq. Here is uh, Jordan. Of course, Lebanon. But this is misleading because what we have here is Sunnis and Shiites crossing the borders and being positioned in two main camps by which to better understand what's going on here. Iran is supporting Bashar in Damascus, instructed Hezbollah, the uh, Iranian client in Lebanon, to cross the borders and to support Bashar in the massacre or the genocide which is being held in Syria against the Sunnis. Sunnis are crossing the border to Lebanon. I hope that you can follow that. But Hezbollah is being sabotaged and attacked by Sunnis who came from Syria, uh, booby traps and uh, other damages that are inflicted upon Hezbollah by those Sunnis. So basically, it's not Lebanon, Lebanese, Syrian, Iraqi identity. It is first and foremost the Sunni versus the Shiites. And again, Druze, Kurds, Persians, Turks, Arabs, etc. This is a plethora of orientations, languages. And basically, this is the discipline we are uh, advancing in Tel Aviv University in my center. First of all, to be familiar with the knowledge of it, the language, sorry, with the history, historical narrative. If you have the, the knowledge of the language and the historical narrative, well, the combination would help you out and better understand how people do memorize their history and why their discourse is being built up in that way. This is one thing. The other thing that uh, I think we should just uh, uh, mention here is uh, kind of a shift when it comes to the 21st century. The non-Arab actors of the Middle East are getting stronger. We are talking about Iran, a Persian state, and Turkey, a Turkish state, at the expense of weak Arab states. So we have a shift, regionally speaking, and of course Turkey and Iran are becoming hegemons in the Middle East and in every equation, in every uh, geopolitical set, those two are very influential. Of course, Iran has uh, power in states like uh, Syria and Lebanon, in Iraq, and, and Turkey also uh, have 
its, uh, let us say, presence when it comes to the north of Iraq, here, and of course in some other uh, places like uh, southeast, uh, sorry, northeast Syria, etc. What I'm trying to say is that, again, states are being broken in most parts of the region. Nation state as a main notion by which to better understand maps or geopolitical maps is not there as the main frame of reference when it comes to the Middle East. And it is becoming misleading to use the map of the Middle East as is. What we are suggesting in our center is what we call the alternative map, the other map of the Middle East. And this is why we do try, actually, to read the map in line with what we call primordial identities or pre-state identities. The other thing I think, sorry, yeah. Just a very quick question. If you could put Lebanon, put the colors in, would the areas to the left be red like, like Syria versus Shia? No, I mean, Lebanon, again, Lebanon is a state that was formed by the French in 1921. There you have Maronites, Sunnis, Shiites, Druze, and that was the key according to which Lebanon was built up. Of course, Lebanon, from the beginning, was cut off from Syria and was depicted uh, by the French as Grand Liban. It's Great Lebanon. This is why Syria actually invaded Lebanon in 1975. And uh, again, I mean, this whole region was conducted by Muslim empires. The notion of nation state was not here. It was brought in by the British and the French, as I said before. People were forced to buy or to adopt national identities, Lebanon, Syria, these are not Arabic names even. These are names that were built in by the British and the French from time to memorial, pre-Islamic time, in order to make sure that those states or those communities are going to follow the line of secular thinking and serve the best interest of the then uh, uh, imperial powers, uh, Britain and France. Well, again, it's a contest of identities. What I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that the nationalistic notion is being challenged, again, by pre-national or pre-state identities. And this is why we do offer to view or to have kind of a different map while dealing with the Middle East. It's very interesting because in the 20th century, the conventional wisdom was that the conflict, according to which to better understand the region, is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. All these phenomena in Mali, in Africa, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, has nothing to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. These are phenomenons that were a kind of a result of what we call the Arab Spring. The Palestinian Israeli that was perceived as a master key through which or with which to solve the regional problems seems to be kind of uh, one among many. And basically while talking about the Palestinian Israeli conflict, as you know, the American uh, uh, when the Americans capitalized on that in the recent months, there was kind of a belief that there is a golden opportunity with which to solve out the problems. And again, I mean, we are back in square, square, in square one, but what I'm trying to say is that Israel, while dealing with uh, this region and uh, having kind of a general look at what's going on, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is still there but it is not the key by which to understand what's going on in the other parts of the region. So even if we would like and understand 
that this is high time for Palestinians and Israelis to get closer to a compromise. Again, it has nothing to do with solving uh, the problems of the other states. What is happening in Syria is a genocide. I happen to be in Jordan, met some uh, injured Syrians that were uh, became refugees and found shelter in Jordan. It's horrible. I can tell you that what's going on in Syria is something which is really, really problematic. I'm using Syria in order to, in this short presentation, to bring in some of the things that are very typical to this changing Middle East or to describe what I call the changing environment. So in a way in Syria, we have what we saw in Egypt with Mubarak and others. We had Bashar al-Assad in Damascus versus the rebels. But again, this is only the ground floor. If you would like to have the other dimension, so again, what I said before, Sunni versus Shiites, boundaries are being smashed, and the whole region, this is the Fertile Crescent, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, is being characterized by what we call pre-state identities. The third level is Syria becoming not only the regional engine, but also kind of a hub for global competition. In sharp contrast to what we had in Libya, for example, when it came to Syria, the new dimension, let's say, is that uh, Russia was to stood or was to stand or was to support Bashar al-Assad, the Americans had to realize that Syria is becoming a source for what we call superpowers competition. This is something we haven't had, we haven't had in the recent decades. So again, Arab Spring, failed states, free state identities, and global competition. All these could be seen in Syria. And Syria is the main engine through which to better understand what's going on in the region. And negative spillovers can be seen in Lebanon, one million Syrian refugees, one million Syrian refugee, refugees in Jordan, in Iraq, 200,000, and in Turkey, 150. Try to think of that. Humanitarian crisis, no man's land. These areas have been taken captive by Al-Qaeda activists who came from Yemen, from Iraq, from every other part of the region. So what we got in nowadays Syria, and again, there is no Syria. People do use the name Syria in order to describe the region where Syria had been before. But this is a Syrian space, which is uh, divided to different power centers. This region is controlled by what we call Al-Qaeda activists. In Arabic, they call themselves Jabhat al-Nusra or Daesh. Daesh is Dawla Islamiya fil Iraq wa Sham, which means an Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. And it goes without saying that while trying to understand what is Qaeda, Druze, Kurds, Bashar, Sunnis, Alawites, well, plethora of orientation. So basically, if you would like to get back to a united Syria, it is undoable. So if somebody is going to Geneva and trying to sell the notion of peace in Syria, well, this is just working with the tools of the 20th century, which again, are not valid, are not relevant. 
for solving the problems of the 21st century. And this is why I use Syria. Let's just move, uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Egypt. Even if we have states, even if we have states where there is no that kind of a mosaic of sects and minorities, in Egypt you have the ongoing contest between religion and state, while state is being taken as a secular phenomenon. Well, this is an ongoing theme which could be found in the history of the region. And if just to make a long story short, I would ask that as kind of a thing that could be found in Syria, so sorry, in Egypt, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states. How instrumental religion should be in forging state and societies? This sounds as an innocent question, but we know when states are getting closer to that kind of a question, what they're going to have is to experience kind of a very painful process according to which to find a compromise between the state and the religion. Egypt is there. Turkey is there. I think that the Arab Gulf states are also there. So we have to take into account also not the discourse which is being created because states were broken and each species or each sect is bringing in his dreams or its dreams and his understanding of what history is. We have also kind of a general question which is applicable to all parts or flanks of the Middle East and the basic or the bottom line is how instrumental religion should be in forging state and societies, very applicable to Egypt. And here comes the other thing. Well, I won't deal with the United States too much, but this is a widely held perception in the Middle East, that the US is a giant in retreat, a giant in retreat. Of course, what was proved in September 2013, when the Russians came in in Syria, and when it became clear that the Russians stand still when it comes to the survival of Bashar al-Assad, when it became clear that the Americans, in spite of their declaration and assessment, that they are going to militarily act in Syria. When this whole saga was ended up in what we call a retreat, that was a signal which was internalized, so to speak, by many radical states and movements in the region who were very, very eager to capitalize on what I call American weakness and the vacuum that was left behind. Well, the United States has its own reasons. Of course, actually, we do understand that there is kind of a trauma that was gleaned from Iraq and Afghanistan. There are other reasons. I don't want to delve too, in too many details about that, but when it comes to the regional players here, mainly Iran, Hezbollah, even Al-Qaeda, and others. Extremists. They interpreted what happened here. And they interpreted the U.S. performance as a sign of weakness. And in the Middle East, when there is a vacuum, it is being filled in by states and movements that from the beginning thought of themselves as superior. Now I mentioned here states like Syria, like Lebanon, 
Iraq. These are newcomers. As I said before, they were created just 100 years ago. But when it comes to Iran, this is a different opera. Iran is a state of three millennia. In Persian, there is kind of a idiom, Tamadoni Bazork, which is high civilization. The Iranians do think about themselves as a leading civilization in the Middle East. I say that because they think that it is high time for them to come to the fore. And what they are doing is just to capitalize on the new situation, including American weakness, in order to skillfully calculate the interim agreement about the nukes, but at the same time to nurture clients all over the region, as I said before. The guy who is running the massacre in Syria is no other than General Qasem Soleimani, who is the commander of the Quds, the Jerusalem unit in the Revolutionary Guards of Iran. This is kind of a common wisdom. But the Iranians are building up kind of a modus operandi. And of course, this course, which is a component to that, on the one hand, Sham offensive, talk to the five plus one, promote their interest when it comes to the economic field and the nuclear fire. And at the same time, as I said before, to nurture clients like Islamic Jihad in Gaza, extremists in Sinai, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and some other Shi'i militant groups in Iraq and Syria. And they are able to do that because they also capitalize on the new situation in the Middle East. And I think that uh, we are in a very, what I call, changing environment. Just try to imagine that each player, including Israel, has to re-foster or recalculate his strategy in line or in accordance with the changing circumstances. And Israel included. Just like uh, the recent week or the, a week ago, those two different wings of the Palestinian reality, Fatah or PLO in the West Bank, and the Hamas in Gaza. By the way, here again, you have kind of an example of how a would-be state, if at all, Palestine, is something that Palestinians are debating about in terms of what comes first, state or secularism. This is what Abu Mazen or Mahmoud Abbas is preaching for, or religionism, which is what Hamas is preaching for. So the notion is, if I would have a Palestine in the future, what sort of Palestine I would like to have? A secular Palestine or an Islamic Palestine? And this is the result could be seen in the breach between West Bank and Gaza. West Bank is being ruled by the secularists. Gaza is being ruled by the religionists. And a week ago, both came up with kind of a compromise by which to forge a unity government or united government 
And this brought in a lot of uh, speculation about what Hamas has in mind, what Abu Mazen has in mind. I would use that in order to provide you with an idea of how players in this region are recalculating their strategy. Hamas, a year ago, got the upper hand because he was count on Egypt, which was ruled by then the Muslim brothers, by the religionists. And Hamas in Gaza thought that if Morsi, if you remember the name, President Morsi in Egypt, is coming to the fore, and Egypt is ruled by religionists, it goes without saying that he could be benefited from that. The problem is that after several months, Morsi was toppled by Sisi, and Egypt became a state which is ruled by military officers, secularist military officers. And the new regime in Egypt began haunting Hamas. To make a long story short, economic predicament. The Hamas found himself on siege because he hasn't got what I call patron. Iran was not there anymore. Egypt was not there. So even an extremist movement like Hamas found itself in kind of a situation where a compromise is needed for the time being. And this compromise that was suggested by or offered by the people of Mahmoud Abbas was taken with eagerness by Hamas in order to, let us say, better his position in a changing environment. Now, what is the motivation behind Mahmoud Abbas drive? This is a very uh, interesting thing. Many in Israel would argue that this is another tactics by which Mahmoud Abbas is trying to persuade the Americans to put some more pressure on the Israelis not to build up settlements and to get back to talks where Israel has to just uh, provide or deliver what was promised from the beginning to the Palestinians. I am of the opinion that we are maybe in kind of a juncture where there could be kind of a reorientation of what I call Palestinian policy. If it is, if it is true that the Palestinians are disappointed of the Americans, let's say, performance, not because the Americans are highly pro-Israelis, because the Americans cannot deliver the whole pie. I think that Mahmoud Abbas and maybe Palestinians are considering changing the orientation away from the United States and towards the EU, the European Union. This could be an introduction to a campaign according to which the Palestinians are going to get, in the end of the day, free and independent Palestine by using legal international mechanisms and approaching the UN. It goes without saying that it would be much more effective for the Palestinians and for Abu Mazen or Abu Abbas if he would come up with one voice In different words, if he would come up with a united Palestinian people, and he could declare that he is the leader of a united Palestinian people, something he was uh, accused of, or something he was challenged by in this argument that if we are going to have an agreement with you, and you sit in the West Bank, who could guarantee us that this would be acceptable by the Hamas also. And if Hamas are going to win you over in an election campaign in half a, a year from now on, again, who could guarantee that the agreement that was 
concluded here is going to be acceptable by them. Now, very sophisticated. Abu Mazen is bringing Hamas in, declaring that Palestine is united behind him, starting the whole legal and international public relation campaign and heading to, heading to the UN in order to achieve an independent Palestine. This is a challenge Israel should know how to deal with. The 21st century, 21st century is bringing in many challenges that could not be solved by mere military power. Israel finds itself in kind of a way where power should be used in kind of a very sophisticated and calculated way. You can't work with the Hummer, just as Kalpo. I mean, you have to be very careful and delicate. Because as I said before, wars in this region have nothing to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict or with Israel. But if you are not that prudent and careful, you could be easily be thrown into Syria, Lebanon, or what I call kind of a bloodshed that has nothing to do with Israel or the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Of course, how to explain Israel when it comes to the international world? This is something that we have to just uh, bear in mind. Of course, again, nine months. John Kerry said nine months ago that we are that close to ending up the conflict. Ending up the conflict. We got an agreement but between Hamas and Fatah, not between Israel and the Palestinians. What one could learn from that is the problem is where the boundary should just stand. Is it necessarily a problem of territory? Or maybe there is something which is much more structural here. Something that the outsider cannot grasp, which is what I think. We have two leaders, Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas, who are or have to take into account the very complex political system or their constituencies. We have here two people that are experiencing mutual distrust. Distrust. This is not something that could be solved by that or that or, or uh, uh, other formula. It's not necessarily what people think. It, it, it would be 95% of the territories to be brought in back to the Palestinians or 93%, as was suggested by Ehud Olmert. The problem is not there, in the reality it's here. Perceptions, conceptions, twisted perceptions of the other. This is part of a very well-known Middle Eastern problem. I always used to say that in this region, we do talk in millennia. It's not uh, decades, it's not even centuries. And this is something that we should take into account. It would take time before people would learn to accept the other. I would put it that way. And it has to do with educational revolution. It has to do with time. Jumping into conclusion or having kind of a quantum leap with which to come up with kind of a formula by which to end the conflict. Uh, this is a mere naivete. 
It says that you do not understand or internalize the real rhythm of what we call the Middle East. And I'm not, uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is what we are educating, or how we are educating our students in Tel Aviv University, in our center. And I think that this is something that should be brought in because the Middle East has a different rhythm. Political scientists would love the idea of having kind of a model to be implemented in other part of the region. What we are saying when it comes to the Middle East is simply that culture matters. And since political culture in the Middle East is something different, you can't have different models being implemented or being brought in from other parts of the world. I mean, what I'm trying to say, this is not necessarily kind of a, something that would result in a positive outcome. And we have seen that a lot in the recent 200 years. I don't know where to stop, uh, Charles, but maybe let's, I don't want to, because I keep talking and I don't, I mean, that's so, so Yeah, so, so what, what, what I'm trying to, don't stop. <laughs> no, so what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, this is what we are, um, we have to emphasize here. It's not the map you see when you look at the Middle East. And we are trying to come up to our policymakers, to our audience, to our students, with the notion of an alternative map. This is not the Middle East we used to see because it's not the U.S. alone. It's Russia and China. And there are different or shifting alliances here. And this is why I said that everybody is recalculating its own future strategy. CC, for example, the president of Egypt, is considering kind of a, a new deal with Russia when it comes to the weapons and stuff. At times, it is a signal which means to be sent to the United States or the Americans as if to say, look, if you are not going actually to keep up to your promise, what we are going to do is just to taste the water and see what China and Russia has to say about that. So everything is on the move. And Israel, because of that, has to take that into account. There is no kind of a solid system with which to understand what's going on, as was the case in the 20th century. We had the moderate Arab camp, and the radical Arab camp with Iran. What we have now is bits and pieces. And in most cases, we don't have states, just power centers. <coughs> this enables some sophisticated players like Iran to come up with double standards policy an indirectly threat on the 5 plus 1 that if they are going to talk about Syria and Iraq it would hamper negotiations and this is exactly what Iran is doing and since the West is eager to have a progress when it comes to negotiations with Iran they turn a blind eye, a blind eye to what's going on in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, etc. and then they're going to pay a heavy price with the negative spillover, spillover effect in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and other states. So we are in the midst of a turmoil. And this is why I said that also Israel 
should reread the map. You should better understand or realize what's going on. And Israel too has to foster a new strategy in order to adjust itself to the new realities of the 21st century. So I'll stop here. Yes, hi. Um, obviously, Hamas is, is, is considered a terrorist organization. Sorry? Can you just speak up, please? Hamas is considered a terrorist organization by both the U.S. and the European Union. Um, but you, while obviously the concern is that this new unity agreement would lead to more of a radicalization of the moderates in the West Bank, do you think there's at all a possibility that by talking more, Abbas might actually be able to convince the Hamas um, agents to secularize more and be more moderate so they don't get stigmatized so much? Well, I think that this is the wishful thinking that the West is, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, the United States, for example, reached at a certain stage to talk to the moderate, moderate wings of the Taliban in Afghanistan. This is the same thing, almost. I do not think that Hamas can change its attitude in accordance with what you said, because if this is what we're going to have, there would be no Hamas. What Hamas is proud of, what he is selling while trying to talk to his constituency, is that in sharp contrast to Abu Mazen or Fatah, we do not recognize the state of Israel. I'm not talking about the state of Israel as the state of the Jewish people, which is something else. But Hamas has a charter. And if you read the charter, the first sentences would be, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, let me just, uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, quote it in kind of a way that would be very, very, okay, here is it. Palestine is not a matter of territory. Palestine is a matter of belief. That is the point of departure. So the conflict is not a matter of materialistic notion. It's not a territory. It's a matter of belief. And here comes the other part of the job. Palestine is a state that is being stretched from River Jordan to the Mediterranean. And there is no whatsoever possibility for other entity to be there. So basically, you know, I mean, uh, now, there would be people, a lot of people in Israel, and they say that loud and clear, that PLO once also did not recognize Israel. But it has changed with the passage of time. So let's talk to the Hamas. I'm not against talking with the Hamas. We do talk to Hamas. And we have kind of a full-scale cooperation with Hamas. But when it comes to importing cement and some other stuff and uh, crossings and daily issues, but it goes without saying that when it comes to the Hamas as kind of a ideological movement, and in this region ideology, ideology talks, it is the main thing in my opinion, They cannot get, I mean, uh, uh, that far as you suggested, because they would, I would say, just leave behind the main tenets with which actually they formed Hamas. They can't do that. They can't do that, in my opinion. So basically, there could be an ad hoc alliance between Fatah and Hamas, and there would be, because both of them are going to be benefited from that. But at a certain stage, the breach will be there between both uh, uh, parts of the Palestinian entity. Was it to follow up from this question very briefly? Yes. Yeah. Um, Ephraim Halevi was here a few weeks ago in Colombia, wrote an op-ed yesterday saying that now is the opportunity to strike Hamas because they don't have any of in your presentation. They don't have any uh, patron for they supporting them. Yeah, but... And he's saying... He, yeah, I know, I know. He said that it's, 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 it's a golden opportunity to topple Hamas in Gaza. Who said that? 
Prima Levi. I, um, you know, Charles, I, I, I'm not sure that this is what I would recommend Israel to do, because I don't think Israel should interfere in Palestinian politics. And even actually Netanyahu's response, if Hamas is in, I'm out. I'm not sure that this is the main thing or the best thing one could do when it comes to that, because if Hamas is in, let Hamas say that he accepts the notion of two states, two peoples. Let Hamas say that he accepts the notion of the right of Israel to exist. So basically just deliver the responsibility to the other side. You have to be very, very smart and sophisticated in that kind of a game. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I know what he said, but I, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that Israel should do that. There's a question. Oh, ah, yeah, sorry. Um, I, uh, one, one of the things you mentioned was that um, I guess the perceived weakness in, in the Middle East of America. And I was wondering if, in fact, what was going on instead was just the policy shift like Obama said, where we care about Syria, but the reality is strategically what's going on. There is no Syria, as you said. Strategically, we don't care. We're pivoting to China and, you know, dealing, working on creating relationships with Asia, etc. And actually, Israel is doing that also. Trade with China has gone up. Israel should do that. Uh, I, mean, I mean, with all respect, Israel should talk to China and to Russia, because this is the new right. king. So ev everyone's doing it, though. Yeah. It's not a question. But, but and, and also just, I think, I'm not Obama thinking. tried tried to intervene in Syria, but couldn't just because the American people and Congress wouldn't go along. OK, so here is the thing. This is America's calculation. This is Obama administration's calculation. And, and uh, again, I'm not going to judge the Americans on that. But if you ask me, what would be the result when it comes to the mind of Middle Eastern players? It is that a lot of vacuum was left behind. It is the old bar, no bite. By the way, this is a slogan that you can find in the Iranian press day by day. Haven't we told you that? And here's the thing. When the Americans saying that all options are on the table for Middle Eastern players, it is clear that all options are there, excluding the military one. And that's the rule of the game. So if you are Iran, Hezbollah, Jihad, Islamic Jihad, you take into account that what may come, the Americans that were perceived from the beginning as a hegemon, the Americans that were invaded or invading Afghanistan and Iraq, they are not going to do that thing. I, I accept that. I mean, I mean, I, I can agree with you that this is the best thing for the Americans. The problem is that this region doesn't know how to handle itself when the big brother is not there. And this is kind of a wake-up call for players like Iran and Hezbollah, even Al-Qaeda and others, to come to the fore. There's a lot to achieve. In the end of the day, the Americans would find themselves with so many negative implications that were left behind, and they have to appease their allies, because if not, if we can just go back to the Syria, just let me show you something, okay? That would be applicable to what we said. Al Qaeda here in Syria and in, and in Iraq is supported. I'll try to be very careful while stating facts by Saudi Arabia, not because Al Qaeda is the cup of tea of the Saudis. But because Al-Qaeda is the enemies of my enemy when it comes to the Saudis. Iran is the arch nemesis of Saudi Arabia. 
And if you are looking for somebody to serve as a power against Iraq or some, let us say, kind of a player that would cut Iran's Iranian axis from uh, the head of the Persian Gulf to the eastern flank of the Mediterranean, that would even uh, Al Qaeda. And just, just think of that. Al Qaeda fighters are being supported by a pro American player. Because this is the only thing the Saudis have in mind in order to stop or block Iraq. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if you come to think of that, it's kind of a mess. Because you have a bunch of calculations, a bunch of orientations. If states are being broken up, as we said before, well, it is becoming kind of a situation that gets out, out of control. And I think that for many reasons, this is something that we have to realize. When you say that the Americans are not willing to even deal with Syria, I tell you something, I mean, you don't know how to deal with that because the opposition is so fragmented there. You have Qaeda A versus Qaeda B. You have Kurds who are going or running as part of the stick gas. There's enough power to keep the opposition alive, but not enough aid to that victory. But this is the sad thing. The opposition is that strong to harass Bashar, but not to talk of him. Bashar is that strong and cruel to damage the opposition, but not to actually uh, abolish it or something like that. So what we have is a bloody state which goes on and on. And people are being slaughtered. People are being slaughtered. Not because they did something. They just were there in the wrong place in the wrong time. That's all. And I'm talking about 170,000 people. And while looking at those young people, who became orphans and refugees in Jordan. After that, when you see this humanitarian crisis face to face, you understand that there is a hypocrisy that should be actually declared all over the place. The world is being comprised of states and powers who are following their particularistic interests at the expense of the life of many people. So if you would like actually this region to be more, let's say, healthier, the people I met in the refugee camps in Jordan, and we do talk about half a million orphans, half a million orphans, these people are the exact recipe for the future agony of this region. Not the Geneva talks, what I just mentioned. So, this is the problem. Yeah. Uh, Syria, as you said, is no longer a state. So, why would there be competition between Russia, the United States, and China for something that they have no national interest or no strategic interest in? No, everybody has an interest. And, and, uh, just one other question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the hegemons of, of uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, I, you, you, I think you implied that they might get together or something. I, I, you no. Said, uh, might, yeah, no, 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 not I together. Mean, they have the current interest in No, 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 not together. Each other. Turks and Persians, right. that is kind of a historic except for rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, listen, if the Russians were to let the Americans to have in Syria the same they had in Libya, which means to topple down the dictator, in Libya, it was Muammar al-Qaddafi. So the game was played that way. The dictator is being toppled by the West, NATO, and the United States. And the Americans, or the Europeans, thereafter, are fostering the later on situation in line with their own interests. What Putin said here, there is no replica. There is no recurrence of the Libyan case study in Syria. Why? The Russians has many bases here in the eastern flank of the Mediterranean. 
they had a fleet here, and they thought about our, our, right, uh, Syria as kind of an asset. If they are going to lose that, they are going to lose their stronghold in the region. And this is why they stood still, and this is why they supported Bashar. The Chinese are everywhere, but economically speaking, they haven't yet translated their economic interests and power to geopolitical ones. Once they are going to do that, that would be a game change phenomenon. But they are everywhere. So this is something that makes you think of the Middle East when it comes to the superpowers. Let's say that you just to be uh, on the safe side, let's say that we have here kind of a change of the guard. It's not the, the Americans are out, but they are weaker. And the power they lost was filled or was kept, was absorbed, let's say, by the Russians, Chinese, and some regional powers like Iran. This is my thesis. So again, you have a different distribution of Yes, please. I'm following up on a point that you made at the beginning of the presentation and with part of the last question, what role, if any, is Turkey playing in all of this, or what potential role could it be playing uh, in the future? Well, Turkey, you know, I mean, this guy, Erdogan, uh, came to power 10 years ago. He thought of himself as a new emperor. He tried to turn Turkey into kind of a hegemon, a regional Middle Eastern hegemon. They failed. But Erdogan, first of all, came up with kind of a, relatively speaking, successful or flourishing economy. He has an opposition from within, but as you see, or as you saw in the last municipal elections, Erdogan is what we call, I don't know if you put it in English that way, uh, I say Hebrew Chaya politic is a political animal. He, He's not educated, this guy. He knows no languages, only Turkish. But he knows how to persuade people, his own people. And when it comes to the D-Day election, he delivers. Turkey is a state in, a shifting, in shifting gears. This is a state that changed the whole notion of secularism that was built up by Ataturk, the great founder of modern Turkey. This Turkey of Erdogan and his party is trying to build up a different formula where religion is much more influential and instrumental in forging the state and a society. It's not easy. But what everyone is doing is a quiet revolution with which to turn Turkey the one time secular fortress of the Middle East to a much more religious state and society. And he's doing well. He is doing well. And again, Turkey is not that. It's not Lebanon, not Syria, not Iran. This is ancient civilization. And try to think of Turkey and Iran looking not, not only at that side of the region, the Arab fold, but at Central Asia, Asia too. And these are the sentinels of the Middle East north and east and each one of them is striving for hegemony so basically there is a concealed competition between turkey and iran and at a certain stage there are many bones of contention contention here but for the time being turkey is trying to recuperate from what happened with the you know corruption saga of Erdogan, the opposition of Park Gezi Park, if you remember, 
Uh, I'm pretty sure that Turkey is a giant when it comes to Middle Eastern politics. If not now, it would be there in the 21st century. It stands there in the north, holding on all those rivers that do provide water to Iraq, to Syria. They have this huge appetite to become leaders of the region. They are very proud. It is similar to Iran, but in a different way. Yes, please. Um, Mori Kadar, your colleague, talks about a larger than two state solution. Is this disintegration in Syria the uh, possible uh, rising of Kurds, perhaps, in Syria and in Turkey and in, in those contiguous areas? Are there opportunities to encourage? a greater number of smaller Canton-like independent areas. The well, Bangunti, when right? you talk about I talk, talk Syria? About Bangunti, I talk about Jafari, I talk about those tribal entities that with encouragement and funding might create well, I, I, semi-independent... Yeah, I don't, I don't think there is another solution. Only federations. Mm -hmm. Only federations. If you would like to solve all the problems of Syria, it would be federations for the Kurds. By the way, they declared their autonomy already. You have Druze, you have Alawites, etc. If you come to think of that, you should take into account the voices of history in this region. This is what I say. I mean, these borders are good. Yeah. But when it comes to Israel and the Palestinians, but you have the same thing among the Palestinians. You have four main tribes. Yeah, but this is a very tiny territory. Still, you have four opportunities to be four presidents or four chieftains and to have four cabinets. You get jobs for everybody. Yeah, but, but this is, here's where actually you have a problem. Because this notion of states to two people mm -hmm. is very acceptable by most Israelis and Palestinians. The problem, how to implement that. And what Oslo actually offered or suggested is the two-state solution. One of which should be Palestine for the Palestinians. What would be the other? What would be the other? The other should be Israel. But Israel should stand firm. Stand firm in its claim and demand that this state should be defined as the state of the Jewish people and its other citizens. I am against the notion of Jewish state because this sounds as a rabbinical state or a halakha state, which is not what we are trying to get. But Israel, in my opinion, and there are many who argue against that in Israel too, I think that if Abu Mazen says loud and clear, we want allowed Israel to become the state of the Jewish people, and the Arab League follows suit, I mean, saying that kind of a no to that thing. You know, I mean, uh, I, I have been here three weeks ago, and I was asked by some congressmen, what is... Uh, why Israel should insist on this state of the Jewish people. I think that when Abu Mazen says that, many Israelis realize that the whole notion of the end of the conflict is not well taken and understood by the Palestinians. Now let me be here very frank and straightforward. The deal is pretty clear. If I'm going to give you 67, you're going to give in return 48. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. The 67 line is the border. But I'm going to give it to you 
only if you're going to declare that there is no right of return to Israel proper and that Israel is the state of the Jewish people and its other citizens. In my opinion, this should be a precondition being set by Israel. And this would be a vivid indication that the other side's understanding that this is the state of the Jewish people and the other citizens. Among them, among them Palestinians. It's very different from Jewish states. Uh, I don't think we should uh, actually use this Jewish state then. The state of the Jewish people and its other, the other citizens. And the Palestinians should accept that. Otherwise, many Israelis rightly would argue that what the Palestinians are doing is what we call the stages strategy. Give me 67, then we'll deal about 48. And this is not acceptable anymore. So if you would like end, this is end. If you do not talk or mean business, we can, can't get closer to a... Uh, yeah. Um, can I just have a quick follow-up? What, what do you say to the uh, based Islamic to those, those who would use the uh, claim of the Islamic willingness to say X in order to get finally to Y, which is, would be the... Well, I mean, this is again the Hamas uh, question or Islamic Jihad. Mm -hmm. These people, the Islamists, are taking what we call Israel as part and parcel of Islamic property. And when this is your point on departure, we have nothing to deal about. And again, you have to ask yourself what this conflict is about. If it is territory, secular people could sit together and get half and half, 70, 30, 40, 60, and etc. If it is a religionist one or a cultural one, well, this is a different game. Because more often than not, those people are coming up with the ultimate goal according to which there is no way we're going to divide or we're going to just uh, share the same territory. It's either you or me, and that's the problem. And this is why I say it has to do with the way you define the conflict. Yes, um. My Arabic is not very good, but there's a, a term in the in the ideology of Islam about taqiyya, which means that you can state something. Concealment, yeah. Concealment, yeah. Sure. and it's that you can basically, in order to further um, the purposes of Islam, you can lie to your enemy and declare whatever they want you to declare in order to further Islam and then you can go back on it. But you can do so that even if, if you are so a secular if they country. Finish, no, don't have to be religious. No, 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 but that's, that's, they have no qualms about it whatsoever. And if, even if they declared that they recognize the state of By the way, this is what Hamas is, by the way, this is what Hamas is arguing. That even if we are going to become part and parcel of a government, that would sit there in the West Bank and would talk indirectly to Israel, Mahmoud Abbas, this is part of what they call hudna. This is not to say that we do recognize the right of Israel to exist. Hudna is a meantime ceasefire. It's something like taqiyya from the other side. Uh, but again, actually, it's... Uh, you know, I mean, it's written there. There is a chapter which is hailed by Ismail Haniya, by the leaders of the Hamas, day by day. So if they write in their manifestation, Israel has no right to exist. So why won't this would be the first condition for them to become an international player or a part of this unity government. Why the world, instead of uh, depicting them as a terrorist organization, but for that matter, 
if you are going to become part and parcel of the Palestinian politics, why won't you omit the sentence that says loud and clear, Israel has no right to exist? And when you see that nobody even mentions that, you understand. We are back to this hypocrisy, and it is not only taqiyya or hudna. Israel has to be strong, very prudent, because what we are dealing here is with the future survival of Israel. And if we are going actually to show or to be that naive in order to forget what I just mentioned, Israel is going to pay a heavy price for that. This would even cause its demolition. I mean, this, this would be, uh, I mean, kind of a recipe for its destruction in the future. You have to remember, Israel is six, seven million people. We are enveloped by 600 million people, Muslims mainly. This is not something which is going to be changed in the coming decades or centuries even. So the recipe is pretty clear. One arm should be that strong because there are many risks and dangers here. The other should be pragmatic. If somebody would like to talk to me on a fair basis, for example, 48 to 67, we should actually cooperate and we should just sit there. If there is somebody who could deliver, we have to be that pragmatic and wise in order to conclude a deal. But only if we have the other arm with us, which has to do that, which has to... Uh, uh, has, uh, has to do with what I call liberty power. Yes? This actually follows up on what you just said. Um, and thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, the, if, if, they, if the uh, U, U, EU and UN route, going that route, if Abbas gets that unity opinion and goes that route, what would prevent, I mean, if then we had that agreement of 48 for 60, 67 for 48, uh, that would have to be part of then an EU or UN uh, negotiated agreement. Do you see a problem with that, or and what would that route look like? The problem is that no, I, I don't see a problem with that. But the problem is, I think that Mahmoud Abbas has decided to let it go. Mahmoud Abbas is a forty-eight guy. He was born in Safad. And he doesn't want to be remembered as the guy who gave up on 48. So, I mean, I just wrote an article saying that he is climbing on Har Nevo, Nevo Mountain, like Moshe Rabbein, so to speak. What he's telling the Palestinians, Mahmoud Abbas, I'm not going to be in the promised land. You're gonna have that. What I'm going to do is to set the stage. International campaign, as you said. Legal campaign. This is what we're gonna have here. The Palestinians and Mahmoud Abbas is, uh, is accompanied by some young and very, very clever advisors, Palestinians, who are holding the model of South Africa. And they are pretty sure that in the long run, this card, EU, UN, this is the recipe with which to get, uh, in the end of the day, closer to independent Palestine. This is what they have in mind. In the meantime, talk to Israel. Because Israel is delivering. If Israel is not delivering, 
It's not delivering. We're going to stop, put that in a halt, and go to the UN. And if the Americans are not going to tame Israel, we're going to use the Europeans. So Abbas is in a win-win situation. If you come to think of it, this is, this is my call. It's my observation. And Israel is at the bay. And this is why I said that Israel should start thinking in a different way. How are you going to deal with that? Well, what you said, the 48, 67, I mean, with the UN and the EU. But you have to explain that. Right. Because when I'm here in the state, you know, people do not know what Israel is. Mm -hmm. Because Israel is taken as far as possible of this Palestine versus Israel. It is as if Israel has no existence of itself. Israel is something that should be understood only in line with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And I found myself explaining Israel all over the world. And I was amazed by how ignorant people are when it comes to what Israel is. And I also actually found myself elaborating of the predicaments of Israel. And that way I get kind of an empathy to the Israeli state. Instead of actually dealing with the blame game, as people call it. Call it. It's very difficult. And we are doing that with our policymakers. Because policymakers, what they have in mind is the blame game. It's not me, it's him. Nobody is listening to you if this is what you are coming up with. We have to make people understand how complex things are. And when we use the Holocaust, we have to make sure that when people like Netanyahu and Paris and others, when they say that we won't let Iran be nuclear, is because there is a Jewish psyche, which is a byproduct of the Holocaust, and you can do nothing about that. If people would understand that Israel has predicaments, Israel has its own defects, if you would, if you would like to, like anybody else. <coughs> I think that this would be. Uh, <coughs> better if people would try to understand it because Israel is taken as a Goliath and the Palestinians date it. Sorry? What is this effect that you It's psyche. It's not something that I can just explain by logic. It's there. You can do nothing about that. I remember that actually in 67 when it was the Six Day War. And I was just uh, a 12 year old guy. And when I looked to my mom, my father, my late father, they were pretty sure that this is the end. Before the war, they were pretty sure that this is what they call in Hebrew, Khuban Bayit Shlishi. Which means, actually, the demolition for the third time of the entity of Israel. I saw it in their eyes. You can do nothing about that. You are so anxious because you are so tired. And you have that kind of history. And you know that nobody, nobody in this region, when this guy is slaughtering his own people. Kids. All people. In such a brutal way. When you see that, you say, listen, first of all, I have to calm myself. Second, I have to be very careful. Because what I'm dealing with is something which is pretty imperative for the future of my next generations. And you know, I mean, 
it's it's a, it's just uh, uh, in, in just 48. And I, I hope that uh, uh, again in the mind, it's ingrained in the mind of people. And for two thousand years, our ancestors have been dreaming about re-establishing a state in that part of the world. They say, actually, the next year in Jerusalem, I am privileged to live their dream. Dream of 2,000 years of my ancestors. Many other Jews' ancestors. I am privileged. Just think of that. And I have to do whatever I can in order to preserve that and maintain it and just think of that in kind of a way that would make Israel be stable even when it comes to this neighborhood. And 48 to 67 is something I can buy. But I need guarantees. I have to make sure that the other side is not trying actually to have a state and thereafter actually to have the remaining. So in light of that, I think it's very important to say, I want to ask a question. We still have some time. So yeah. We have to let you through. Um, it's yeah. yeah, so we have about 15 more minutes. So I, I want to follow up on, I think, your very important comments. And we were, we were speaking earlier, too. I, I you know, we, for the Jewish people, for Israel to exist, in our lifetime is really a miracle, an extraordinary thing. And we just celebrated Passover, which is a celebration for the Jewish people of uh, being in Jerusalem. And I spoke last night about how Jews from all over the world are coming to Israel. And Israel, as an example, sent uh, military. I, was, I landed in Antebu and uh, have connections with uh, bringing Ethiopian Jews to Canada that were stuck in the Sudan. Um, when, when the Israeli military sent their, their air, air force, their carriers, to bring back Ethiopians to Israel, despite the problems which exist in Israeli society and do, the, the, the country erupted in celebration because this was a fulfillment of a Jewish uh, belief that the Jews would come back to Israel from the four corners of the world. So something extraordinary. And we have to be strong, we have to be rooted in our culture. My question is, I find in the United States, um, the level of cultural assimilation, even in the political sphere, the notion that, for example, that Jerusalem could be anywhere. Jerusalem could be in Los Angeles, Chicago, it could even be in the White House. When in Jewish culture, and we're clear, to be free as a Jew, according to Jewish culture, there you have to fulfill certain obligations spiritually. You have to be in Israel, in Jerusalem, the physical land of Israel. This is Jewish people and culture. In the American political system, we seem to, to some extent, forget that or put it on a back burner on the one hand. And on the other hand, your presentation to me is like, um, it's a rude awakening. It's a rude awakening because the New York Times and the intellectuals at Columbia University see the Middle East in such simplistic f forms, and the whole Palestinian-Israeli peace process is still perceived as the key, the, the magic, and the golden key to bring the end of jihadism and peace and everything will be fine if only the Israelis would change. And to me, that's rooted in anti-Semitism. And I'm choosing my words carefully as a scholar. The Jews were the ones who had to change when the world viewed uh, the dominant way of seeing reality is through the lens of religion and Christianity. The Jews were the wrong religion and they had to be transformed to save the world. And people were viewing reality through the lens of race and ethnicity and nationalism and national identity. The Jewish race was poisoning the, the white race and nation and they had to be eliminated to protect the white race and the white nation. Today, People actually believe here that if only the Israelis would change, that the world would be safe. And it's extraordinary to me. We don't see 170,000 people in this not an issue. The problem is Netanyahu. 
not that slaughter that's going on here. They don't speak about Iran anymore. Iran is building a nuclear weapon. Yes. The, it's the Jewish lobby's problem that we had. But Charles, you can see how sophisticated the Iranians are. Yeah. This was part of the whole problem. Not only to launder the nuclear problem, not only to recuperate economically speaking. What the Iranians did is sort of, I would say, a diplomatic revolution by which to shift the attention to the other side of the region. And don't talk about Syria and Iraq, where the Iranians are very, very influential. Um, I think that Israel should be uh, that clever. <coughs> that clever. Because it's, 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 it's a different ball game. It's not the 20th century. And this is why we, I mean, I say we have to have a new set of tools. Some of them, tools of diplomacy, some of them military, and, 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 and so on. And I agree with you, uh, the simplistic notions of what the Middle East is. This is actually my discipline. This is how we are educating our students in Tel Aviv University. And in terms of the Middle Eastern studies, we are. I won't say the best, even if it's true, because it's not <laughs> them. But I mean, we are the greatest. I mean, we have uh, 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 many students. We have uh, uh, even policymakers in our uh, uh, in some of the programs. What we are trying to do is, first of all, to say, beware. If you are coming up with simplistic notions in this region, you're going to get, in the end of the day, a bad look. In order to better understand what's going on here, first of all, you have to have a picture of the mosaic of sects, of movements, history, narratives. And if you combine all these, you're going to have, I think, a formula that would help you all to better understand what's going on, even if you don't know what actually comes next, but what's going on nowadays. This is, this is yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask you um, three points, uh, point three things. Firstly, as regards the international community, why is there such a reluctance to intervene in the, um, the humanitarian aspect of um, the situation that's going on in Syria? I know that the United Nations they have meetings after meetings on the situation, but it's, it seems as if the whole um, international community is basically turning their backs. You see children suffering every day in Syria, but nothing concrete is being done in that aspect. Well, this should have been done from the beginning. Yeah. With the Americans waiting mm -hmm. and the world waiting for, let's let them fight each other and then we're going to decide who is getting the upper hand and how to handle that. What happened is that the opposition became so fragmented. Again, each one of the elements of the opposition is promoting his own interests. Kurds, autonomy. Qaeda versus movements. Even the Sunnis in Syria, the main opposition. You have the Free Syrian Army. You have the National Coalition. I can tell you that I met many oppositioners in Europe. And they promise a lot about the day after. But they have no power in Syria itself. You've obviously a Geneva peace talks. No, that is, nobody talks about that anymore in the United States. I mean, if you talk about peace and about Syria, these are two terms which are not relevant. Not peace and not Syria. So I, I get back to what, what was mentioned here. First of all, you have to internalize the fact that what we have is a bunch of power centers. So if at all, what you have to think is sort of a federation. Listen, this state, can you go to, and just for kind of a concluding note, can you go to the map of Iraq? I mean, there was, yeah, yes. Have a look at what's going on in Iraq. There were elections yesterday in Iraq. But look at Iraq. Oh, if you don't know where it is, I don't know. Ah, yeah. 
should be here. Uh, Syria. Yeah, here is Iraq. Great, great. Iraq. This is a de facto Kurdish state. De facto. The United, United Nations do not recognize this, but de facto Kurdish state. Now, Kurd, Kurd, Kurds are, I mean, their language is Kurdish, not Arabic. They are part of Iraq, but basically they, they have own dealings with Turkey out there, because almost half of the oil of Iraq will be found here. This is Shiite Iraq. Remember that Saddam, the Sunni guy, was toppled. Well, the Americans thought then that if 60% of the population of Iraq are Shiite, it would be logic to have a Shiite prime minister. The guy is Maliki. He is there, but he is has, let's say, some good working relations with Iran. So, what was left is the Sunnis, 25% of the population. Now they are becoming deprived of everything. So they are here. And here is Syria. Okay? What we have here, exactly at the place where the Americans were until December 2011. Here, Fallujah. That was the headquarter of the Americans. Now it is the capital city of Al Qaeda state in western Iraq. Sunnis, Shiites, Kurds. And in order to just have that as a concluding note, I dealt in my PhD with the history of the Persian Gulf. One of the documents that were pretty uh, fascinating was a document that was talked about the formation of Iraq in 1921. The Foreign Office in London sent kind of a cable, telegram, to the High Commissioner in Iraq, the British, Arnold Wilson. And the question was that, since Iraq is kind of a three different items being brought together. Who could guarantee us that in the long run Shiites won't go for the Sunnis, Kurds for the Arabs, etc. And here is the reply that was sent by Arnold Wilson 1921 to London. It won't happen. We shall teach them to let Biden be Biden. Thank you. Thank you very much for an amazing analysis and presentation.